here, and I'm going to start to worry. But we always have good good crowds on the days it snows for some reason. <laughs> Maybe it's because you can't golf or can't garden. A uh, couple of things before we start. Again, we have memberships available, and the advantage of the membership is a 15% discount in the gift shop. Plus, of course, being a member of the foundation and and donating for the building of the museum and the acquisition of aircraft and whatever else. Uh, I, this this man left a couple things off his biography when he, he talked to me. Uh, he left his rank off, and that's why I didn't put it in the newspaper. Uh, retired as lieutenant colonel. He tells me he was enlisted twice and commissioned twice. He couldn't make it as, enlist, uh, as an enlisted man, and so they commissioned him. <laughs> but he retired as lieutenant colonel. And the second thing is, I picked out of his biography, was that he evacuated wounded from the Chosun Reservoir in Korea. If you remember, they did that with a lot of old C-47s and very small single-engine aircraft. And maybe we ought to have that story today. Maybe we bring him back to let him tell that story. Uh, but Colonel Mosley, we'll turn the time over to you. And the hour's yours. You can run it any way you want to. And uh, oh, don't look for a clock. We quit when you're finished. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, except that it has some drawbacks. I reached choke points in this thing. Somebody run low. My wife, I will feel all okay. Okay, you guys. Now this is the frozen chosen area. I want for the ground pounders that are here. I want to you up around the frozen chosen area. Uh, mm -hmm. And well, let me turn it right side up, okay? And this is the Chosen Reservoir, nice flat country and all. So if you uh, if you were there, you might want to come up and look at that a little bit. I'm going to jump right into this and try to be real uh, business-like because I have so many family here today, it's going to be difficult. Does it hurt if I'm over near the mic, uh, Eloy? No. Doesn't hurt, okay. Uh, I'll tell you about me. I had 32 years of active duty, listed twice, commissioned twice, and, and uh, Deloitte told you why they commissioned me. Uh, and I've had a wonderful experience, and you know, having a wife that likes the military, that makes all the difference in the world. And my wife did. She'd go, oh, she'd go back tomorrow. Not me, but she'd go back. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was born in Texas, uh, but I came to Delta, Utah as my home. I graduated from junior college down in Dixie where I met my wife and we got married not long after that. Uh, then I went, I enlisted in 1942. Uh, I got in aviation cadets in February of 1943 and I graduated in, with 44A in January of 1944, Group Field, Arizona. Uh, by that time, I already had a little fighter time. They gave us about 10 hours in the old P-40 before we graduated from our AT-6s there. Then I went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where we had our transition to the old P-47, the jug, some people call it the bucket of bolts. And uh, it was a pretty good old reliable aircraft, and that's the one we went overseas with. Now, I arrived in my unit overseas in June of 1944, and it was a 78 8th Fighter Group, I was in the 84th Fighter Squadron. We were the 8th Air Force. Uh, a lot of the guys I trained with, we went together to certain points and then we separated. I understand this morning that uh, that one of your first speakers this uh, this year was uh, uh, General Greenwood, Ray Pete Greenwood, who, uh, I with whom I trained and uh, we went overseas together and as luck would have it, we got <coughs> shot down at different places and and we happened to come out of France at about the same time, but we came home together. The old P-47 was initially designed to be a high-altitude escort aircraft. It had a tremendous surf, uh, supercharger that sat, it, that sat in the back of the, can you hear me now? Okay. That sat in the back of the, the pilot. I have uh, known a case too where the plane was so bad it shot up, shot up that the supercharger fell out of the thing, but it was, had a lot of firepower. 
And as you know, the P-51 pretty much uh, took over on the escort mission because it was faster, longer range, uh, didn't need fuel like the P-47, uh, and it was maneuverable. It was a good escort aircraft. And they started putting the P-47 on ground targets and this sort of thing about the time we were getting ready to go overseas. And we were looking at each other and said, geez, we're not going to make it. <laughs> we're going to have us down there on the ground. We've been training to, to fly at this high altitude. Um, okay, uh, by the time we got there, most of our missions were ground targets. Uh, our, my unit was at Duxford, which is up near Cambridge in England. Uh, just a little bit east of it. My wife and I went back to Duxford here about three years ago. It's been converted into an air museum, museum for the country. Something like this, although you have a much nicer building here. They used uh, mainly the old hangars there and converted those things into uh, their museum. And as luck would have it, the plane I flew from Duxford was the old P-47 and they had one there in the hangar. They rolled it out later and when they found out that I had flown in that plane from that field, not this particular aircraft, but the P-47, they had let me get up in there and have my picture taken. Uh, that was one taken in 1944. And the reason I stuck this one here is my oldest son was a project officer on the 117, and he uh, also was a test pilot with it for work with it something like four or five years, uh, long before we knew it existed. Uh, okay. By the way, our field was a grass field with some PSP on it, and it, it allowed, uh, it was wide enough that four ships could take off abreast, which was really facilitated our taking off and joining up with the rest of the squadron, because we took off with one ship or two ships or something like that, everybody had to find who they belonged to and join up and before you go on your mission. Uh, so it was really uh, nicely set up for that. Uh, Joshua, will, will, will you go in and ask them if they've got a cup and I can have some water? Okay. That's not Joshua. That's the power behind the throne. It just did that. Okay. Uh, on July the 4th, which was my third mission, let me tell you about my first mission. Uh, we took off and uh, we were supposed to go and hit an airfield which was northwest of Paris along the same river no reported any aircraft in the area. Well, we got there and we made our dive bomb run. Uh, I had a bomb hang up on my aircraft and after everybody else was through of the squadron, we had 36 airplanes there. They said, now you go back with the other two guys and see if you can shake off that bomb which was hanging by one end of it on that, uh, what, what do you call it? Shackle. Shackle, that's right. Okay. But see, we had already armed these buggers, uh, and you did that by pulling up the lever on the floor. If it hadn't dangled, there's a possibility that you can push that thing down again, and the pin will go back in if you're lucky. Um, we had to be three of us that day, so by the time we got, they had us try to shake this thing off. When I went back, they had a lot of battery aircraft fire, you know, puffs of this, black and white stuff. Thanks very much, you know. When I went back and looked at that thing, it just looked like it was a solid mass of any aircraft. It was just the smoke and stuff was hanging there. And I went back and dipped my nose a little bit and tried to shake that thing off and it didn't come off. And so then I, I, I came out of there as quickly as I could, but it looked like these guys were way out there. And you know, on the old P-47, we had what we had, uh, a water injection system. I gave it everything it had, and when I caught up with the unit, I went about 200 yards past my flight before I could slow down enough <laughs> to get back in with it. Well, I didn't want to be left over there. I didn't even have any idea how to get back to England from over there. It seemed like that would be simple. Boy, funny, but it, uh, you could really get some trouble if you didn't know where you're going. Well, we got back to the airfield, and they made those of us who still had bombs on land last just in case, and this fills you with confidence too. <laughs> um, so we landed last and they would say, now keep it out in the middle of the field. This field was about 200, 250 yards wide. So we did that and uh, we all got in okay. But they told a story about a, a guy who had 
previously had the similar trouble and his dropped off and exploded and destroyed the aircraft and him as well. So, here we go for my third mission. We're up to third mission, that's the last one. Uh, we got about 3.30 in the morning. Uh, we went and had the quick breakfast. We went for a briefing and then we went out and kicked a tire and, and climbed aboard and we were off about 5 or 5.15 in the morning. And again, we were supposed to go and get another hidden airfield somewhere in the vicinity of Paris. Uh, uh, after we got airborne and we were out flying out across the channel and, and, and we penetrated into France. Now we, we picked up flak as we crossed the shoreline. As we, uh, and it, to me that's where it looked like it was heavy but they said it was nothing really. And uh, I'm sure the bomber pilots would, have, would agree. They only threw it up there because they were supposed to I think at that point. Uh, but these guys kept calling in bogeys. And we had a mirror set, sitting right up on top of the canopy on the old one, which sat right up there. And you could look back and see, and they'd say, bogey's 3 o'clock, and I'd go, they'd say, 6 o'clock. I never saw them. And I said, gee, you know, I'm going to get shot down. I can't even find these doggone guys. <laughs> well, anyway, as we went along, and we got along the same river, uh, clouds started to change accumulating down low on the deck and by the time we got to the vicinity of the target area it was uh, it was not possible to proceed to that target. So then in all of these cases you go back and look for targets of opportunity. Well, Rouen, they pronounce it Hua, that's where Joan of Arc was burned at stake, was a major crossing point for the German soldiers going either reinforcing or retreating. Uh, and we knew the weather was good there, so we went back along, along the same, picked up these vehicles and troops and whatnot on one side of the, the river, and then we proceeded to give them all we had. See, now we still had our bombs, in which we, you normally get rid of those on your first run, which we did, and then you come back and spray the heck out of everything. And when you got 850 caliber machine guns, you can really chew up lots of stuff. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, are any of you old Army guys here? Are there any old Army guys here? Okay, we, Army Air Corps, you remember? That's what we were in, uh, back then, so we were Army at that time. But they had these quad 50s that they mount on either a, a small uh, track uh, vehicle. And gosh, you know, they can shoot up a building pretty badly with just four of those. So with eight, we had a lot of firepower. Each weapon had about 367 rounds. And you could expend it all in 20 seconds, or, which you normally didn't do. You know, you normally, you're, uh, if you strafe, you'd be two or three seconds or four seconds, something like that. But anyway, on my second pass in there, I dropped my bump. I was coming back to do some strafing. I heard something real loud and felt the bump. Now, I had felt some bumps before, but they were prop wash and stuff like that from other aircraft because you get 36 aircraft milling around, you really turn up the air. And uh, sometimes it becomes more dangerous uh, getting knocked down with one of the other aircraft than it is by the enemy. But by the time I got back, those guys were ready. And if you recall, they had trucks that had plywood side boards up on them. They could drop those and that disclosed their anti-aircraft capability. And they, they knew how to use those and the German soldiers were really good. Anyway, I heard this loud explosion right near me, and I felt a, a bump in the aircraft. Then I started picking up oil uh, on the canopy, and so I uh, I knew that I'd been hit. And I climbed up, and the, the aircraft was running pretty good. But I called and said I'd been hit, and the leader then assigned a, a, a pilot to escort me back. Now this is July the fourth. June the 6th was D-Day. Oh, it took those people a long time to get off of that beach area down there. They were out on the end of that peninsula for so long. Well, they were still out there. Uh, the idea was now I'd been hit. There was no, no telling if I could make it or not. So we uh, started back for the our lines, not directly towards England. And then things were going, okay, then, then we'd then we try to fly across the channel to England. Well, in uh, maybe two, three minutes, it began rough, running rough. I switched tanks. I did lots of things. 
and I knew I was in trouble because I couldn't get enough power to climb. But I had gotten back up to about 3,500 feet. And if you subtract about 800 feet from the ground, so that made about 2,700 feet above the ground. The thing quit a couple of times. And buddy, the old hair stood up on the back of my head, and my palms got sweaty, and all that stuff. And I said, oh, gee, third mission, you know, they shouldn't do this to me. <coughs> Anyhow, I, uh, it finally quit. It finally quit. But a couple of times I had already unhooked my oxygen mask, which was okay, we were low altitude. I didn't even plug my radios and was getting ready to get on the thing. And the thing that started catching again, why not get back in again? And um, finally it quit. And you can imagine, that was a great big old four blader prop on that aircraft, what kind of drag it had. Now you guys that flew in a big guy, a big planes. You remember they, they, they had a bad engine or something like that, they feathered the engine. Well, here was this thing stuck frozen in, in place. So I started losing altitude real quickly. And I told, called Lear and told him I was leaving. And I called a friend of mine. I'd been his best man at his wedding. And I said, Leho, I'll be seeing you soon. And I bailed out. And it seemed like I was calm. You know? I'd always planned this. And we, we planned to get out of that plane so that you didn't hit that horizontal stabilizer. This thing right here, see that thing right there? That can, that can chop you in two. So uh, uh, I went out the way I'd always planned to get out if I had time, and I just went out and rolled off the right wing. Another reason for doing this, if the engine was running, there was torque created, and if you went off the right side, it would carry you away from the plane and, and maybe away from that horizontal stabilizer. A lot of guys turned it over on their back. I think there's somebody here that uh, was telling me about uh, the, their relative rollers on the back, and, and then they just dropped out and did their safety belt the way they went. I hope they unhooked their oxygen mask and their real <laughs> Give them a real long neck before they got the <laughs> uh, Okay, so I rolled out, and I finally reached over. Well, I didn't fail. I think I had a hold of that thing when I went out and got on and I didn't want to lose track of it. And then uh, I pulled this rip card. First of all, I was tumbling a little bit, so I stick out an arm or leg and try to crack that. And didn't realize, but I was using, losing up, uh, using up a lot of altitude. So I pulled this thing, and it seemed like forever before that shoe popped. But when it did, it just seemed like it pulled me right back up in the air. That's not really what happened, but uh, it felt that way. And I hit the ground. I never saw it. I never saw it. I was that close to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something here in a little while. I'll just uh, tell you why that was a good idea. You know, I was a pretty clever jumper. Uh, <laughs> because nobody could see that from any distance. Okay, I hit the ground. I looked down, I saw a pair of feet. <laughs> I kept looking up. There's a man there. I, boy, he's about four. He was this, this tall gentleman here in the center with a, with the blonde hair. <laughs> and I looked at him, and he looked at me. I was scared, and he was scared. Uh, I didn't know any French. Not a word of French did I know. So I, finally, I said, hello. Uh, it was all occurred. So I take off this chute and run for it, which was a real bad idea. But we had heard some of the French were collaborators and uh, would turn you over to the, the Germans. So I, uh, but I said, hey, this is it or it isn't. So I said, hello. And pretty soon he kind of ascertained that I wasn't a German. He didn't know whether I was a German or not. He had to be very careful how he handled me. And he, he made, signs of rolling up the parachute. And I said, yes. So we rolled up the parachute, we ran up to one of these little sheds, and buried this thing in the wheat. And then we went in the house, and he called his wife, and she came out, and she was horror struck. Uh, Mama came out, and she...
she was a real great lady. And uh, horror struck as she was, Papa gave her so, so many instructions on, you know, and beat, beat, nolly, and that means hurry, and let's get this thing on the road. She went and ran into the room, got me some clothing, and I, I was trying to convert from Papa, and I said, ah, you escaped yet, it's out on the parachute. So back we went out to the, uh, the wheat, and we dug that parachute up and pulled off that escape kit. There was also another little packet I noticed, so I pulled that thing off and ran back into the, the kitchen and uh, opened up this escape kit and had some little small compasses that you could hide in the orifices of your body or somewhere and some little compact uh, meat, I mean food supplements, uh, some money. Uh, it had a rubberized phrase chart in, in English, French, um, I guess Dutch, Dutch, and maybe I don't know. Anyway, it might be in Spanish because some of our people walked out through Spain in those days. Uh, so I could take this phrase chart and I a chart and I could talk to Pa. I could, part, uh, could point to an English phrase and he could look over and uh, uh, see what it said in French and he could point to another French phrase and so on. And so we're there trying to talk. Meanwhile, Mama's taking uh, gone to get a lot of clothing. <coughs> she brought it out and dumped it on the floor. And they were telling me to take off the clothes. I'm still trying to talk to Pa. And one of the things I said, where are the Germans? And he just went oh, just like that. I said, oh, hey, you know, it's not for me. Uh, anyway, they got some clothing on me. And one of the trouser legs was torn pretty much along the seam, put down one leg. Mama was down sewing this up. And she fixed a little lunch bag uh, and uh, with a bottle of some stuff in it. And that was about, a, oh, by the way, though they, he had run to get his son up, who was about a year and a half younger than I, Bernard. And Bernard came in and, and he came on. By that time, Papa knew that I was not uh, Anglater. He thought I was uh, British, that I was an American. And boy, he announced that when his son came and his son ran over and grabbed me, you know, and gave me those kisses on both cheeks twice. Uh, and I had a bloody nose, and I'd wiped it off, and I had <laughs> little scratches on my face. I'd never been kissed by a man in my life. But I didn't know, you know, I thought, hey, this is, this is a different culture. Anyhow, but, uh, Papa grabbed me, and out of the house we went, and uh, with, I had this lunch bag on my shoulder, and as we approached the front gate, we could hear somebody walking up this little lane, a little gravel lane from the front gate, and he, he says, quick, into the little shed. He put me into the end of a big barn and had a little shed on the end of it. And I got in there, and the old man came to the gate, and he told Papa that he had seen the airplane go over, and he saw something falling from it. And what he thought it was was a fuel tank, because uh, I learned that the, uh, the French in that area would take these metal fuel tanks, and they would cut them halfway in two, and they'd open them up and use a water trough for their, for their stock. Uh, and Papa says, uh, well, I think it's out in that wheat field about a quarter of a mile long, so the guy took off, and, and Papa came back and got me. But before we left the little shed, I took off all ID. Even my uh, dog tags, and you don't take your dog tags off because if you're caught without your dog tags, then they can treat you as a spy and shoot you on the spot. They might have done it anyway. I don't know. Can you hear me out there now? Can you hear me? Okay. So I took off everything. I had a pen with my name on it. And we kind of buried it in a little hole. And we were on our way. Now all this had taken maybe 20 minutes at the outside. We started walking across some fields. <coughs> This is Papa. I landed in the. I landed out here in his uh, apple tree, and but we took this route and we walked over to his brother's house. His brother was George, but George was a prisoner. His family was there, and there was another family that had left Rouen up on the same river, had moved out there to escape the bombing and that sort of thing. And he stuck his head in the house and yelled, and all these people started pouring out of the house. And everybody, oh la la, and you know, that's all sort of thing, and uh, I couldn't understand a word. But all of a sudden, I thought, hey, I heard an English word or two. 
I looked, there was a guy standing up on the steps coming out of the attic area, and he was talking to me in broken English. And I said, oh boy, this is great. And um, this was Hola, uh, and he tried to explain to me what they were planning on doing with me, and after everybody really left me over, and so they took me, he and Papa and I, then walked out through the farm, and we walked out to this part right here. Now this is supposed to represent a forest. It's one of the largest forests in uh, in France. It's a Breton forest. And it, these people were all there real close. Most of this area out this direction was pretty clear, even of uh, hedgerows and things. As you got into this area here, there were a lot of hedgerows. Anyhow, they took me out and they put me here. Now I had my lunch bag and that's all I had. And while I explained to me that uh, he would be coming back and forth to see me and he'd bring me some blankets and stuff like that to lie out there in the forest. They have heavy dues. Our hard brain uh, probably would be about equal to one of their heavy dues over there in this part of Normandy. Uh, and in this corner, the forest was pretty clean underneath. There was this little road that went by, but there were these very tall ferns uh, in this particular corner, and they sat me down in that, and then they went off and left me. But Hola, before, now his name was Roland. Hola is the way the French said. He said, when I come back, he said, I'll whistle, whistle while you work from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Do any of you know that song? Whistle while you work? Okay, that sounds, well, oh, hey, that sounds really unusual to me. Uh, and he came back towards evening, brought me some bedding, and brought me a little bit more food or something. But okay, I'm sitting out here, and it's, uh, what, seven o'clock in the morning, still real early in the morning. And I'm sitting there, and I said, you know, I've had a lot of bad dreams in my life, but this is one of the worst ones I can't, this cannot be me. I just was having a hard time coming to grips with the fact that this was me sitting in this forest. And I, said, I even pinched myself, you know, a little knock on the head. And I listened to the, I listened to the, um, oh, the doves, wild pigeons actually, and they had a cooing sound. It sounded like shoo shoo baby, if you remember back in those days. It, I, I, the rhythm and everything is just about like that. And I sat there. And my ear, I can pick up every sound imaginable. Well, hold on, came back out, brought me some food and stuff, and I bedded down there up there that night. And the next day, oh, mm. no, he.